So let's start. Thank you for staying until the end of the conference. And thank you for, um, well, I was, uh, if you didn't notice, this talk was meant to be in the morning. But I say a lot of things about society today, and I, and I realized that Lufthansa didn't want me to say it. That's why they canceled my flight yesterday and made, made me rebook and come in this morning. So I live in Malaga in Spain, which is about four hours flight. It took me 24 hours to get here. And uh, I've actually gone to China in less time than coming here. But it, the, everything has a silver lining, right? And the silver lining with this is that this talk is, you know, they say that keynotes should be inspiring and uplifting and, and have people excited, which is one of the reasons that they put them at the beginning of a, of a conference, right? To get you all railed up and excited. This is probably by far one of the most depressing talks I've ever given. So it's actually quite good that it's at the end of the conference, right? And uh, in fact, that this is more appropriate. That light blue is very horrible, right? But they said, oh, no, you've got to put our slide at the beginning, and it's this nice, and I said, no, black. Black is nice. <laughs> so I had the second slide, which was Welcome to the Machine. How many of you know this song by Pink Floyd? Okay, you're going to love this talk then. If you don't like Pink Floyd, then, yeah, leave. No, I'm joking. <laughs> anyway, so what, it, and I'll tie back into uh, what, what this is about with Pink Floyd. But talking about Pink Floyd, Roger Waters also had another CD, which was called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And, but it was based on a book by Neil Postman, that was written in 1985, and it was talking about the telegram, radio, and later on the TV. How many of you have read that book? Okay, one person, excellent. And he was talking about how, essentially, telegram, and later on radio and TV, but more importantly, TV at the time, started to give us information that was really not relevant to us. So the telegram, you know, both in the olden days, we, we, we used to live in our little towns and we were aware of our daily newspaper of what was going on and stuff like that. And then the telegram came and said, you know, now I'm going to tell you about what's happening in this other town. And then that other town became another town further away. And then it became another city and then another country. And then we started to see complete views of exactly everything that's going on in the world. And then came the TV, right? And the TV is kind of like, oh, you know, this is amazing because it allows me to do much more than just talk or have people read things. It needed to be entertaining because people needed to be entertained. And the TV went from, you know, the, or the news went from, let me just tell you what's going on to let me try and entertain you. And TV required this because there was more and more channels coming up, and there was more and more competition. So you needed to be entertained. To get the audience, you needed to be entertained. And Neil Postman was talking about how, with the proliferation of TV, there was so much information that was coming out that it was impossible for us to actually be informed. He said, television is altering the meaning of being informed by creating a species of information that might probably be called disinformation. And it isn't false information, but it's misleading because it's fragmented, it's superficial, and it's giving you this sense that you know without actually knowing. And he was talking about the TV. He wasn't talking about social media. There's another book, which I'm guessing a few more people have read, which is A Brave New World. Show of hands. So in A Brave New World, it was written by Aldous Huxley in 1931. And in it, the idea was that I have a controlled population that was created artificially. We had people created for different types of roles, psychological manipulation. And we were basically all the time high, right? And what Neil Postman was saying is that a lot of people were worried about the George Orwell scenario in which we would have censorship, we would have control, etc. And he said that that isn't the worry. The worry is that we end up in a situation where there is so much information 
And we're so entertained that we don't care about the important things anymore. We just care about the stupidities, the silly things. So what he was basically saying is that, in short, Orwell feared that what we hate will ruin us, whereas Huxley feared that what we love will ruin us. And his book was about whether Huxley was actually right as opposed to Orwell. Fortunately for him, we've, we've, I mean, unfortunately, they were both kind of right. So he was saying about his book is that, you know, this is, this is about the Aldous Society, not the Orwell Society. So let's fast forward to today, right? The TV, forget about, I mean, who, does, who, who watches TV? Nobody watches TV anymore. We watch Netflix and we watch all of these different things. And then came this thing, which if, if you're old enough as me, you've used one of these, which was called a modem, otherwise known as the internet. Back then it was this. And in this internet, a lot of started things started to change, and printed media, one of them start, needed to survive, because they're like, oh, we can't print it much anymore, people are going and reading online, so what do we do? And they started to, you know, push their stuff online, and they had a lot of information, and they started to say, well, we need to pr provide some way to support our journalists. And they saw a very big opportunity, which was called advertising. And they thought, oh, that's really, really nice, right? I've got this beautiful little corner there where I can place some advertising, and it's going to work really, really nicely. Now, they called it revenue. We called it annoying banners. This is my local paper without an ad blocker. How many of you use an ad blocker? Right? So this is how my mother would see it. Not me, my mother. This is another one. This is in Spain. That little uh, section at the top over there, right at the very top there, that actually scrolls down as you're scrolling down. So you can't even read the article. But it's okay because you have to click on the ad. But this is what it has become. And this is Spain, right? So in Spain, what we generally do is we take an idea and we take it to the extreme. And if it's a bad idea, we implement it really badly. So how did we react? We installed ad blockers. How did the media react? They said, we've noticed your ad block. How did we react? We said, screw you. I'm going to open up Chrome tools, and I'm going to get rid of that overlaying div. Because well, I'm not paying for this crap. Me pay for information? Get out of here. Now, many took the route of native advertising. How many of you have heard of this notion of native advertising? It's been around for a very, very, very long time. If you take a look at, for example, this is The Guardian, which thinks it's liberal. Uh, if you take a look at this, you see that, um, yeah, someone got that. Uh, you see that there's a little square that says paid content. Do you see it? So that means native advertising. And it's somehow a little bit different. They try and make it a little bit different because they have to, so you don't come and sue them. But then, you know, it's like you never need to feel you're depriving yourself. Okay, self, self-help things. Now, imagine there you could have an article that says it has been discovered that uh, being a vegan will kill you. Now, my mother will look at that and say, whoa, this is bad. It's on the newspaper. Being a vegan will kill you. And then in the little corner, which a lot of people won't notice, it says sponsored by Meets R Us. That's what native advertising is. They say, create content that our audience may like, but it's okay, you can pay for it. And we don't dig in to see who's behind that corporation paying for that. So that's what native advertising is, and it blends in with the content. This is all around. Look around. Look on your web, the news, anywhere you go, it's all around. Now, some interpret news as facts. But what they start to do is they start to target you. Because now if I go to the Guardian in Spain, it will say, the most used alarm system in Spain. And if I go to Germany, it'll say the same thing to me in Germany, in German. And it's called targeting advertising. Because it's allowing to track people. They call it personal experience, also known as personal manipulation. Because the difference between a billboard, although that's about to change as well, but a billboard that you drive past and you see an advertising versus the banner is that that is customized to you. They know about you, and they're targeting you, whereas a banner is targeting everyone. That's the difference. Fortunately, though, 
things are changing. We have the general data protection regulation that's come into play, which essentially means we've got a hell of a lot of pop-ups now. And we have people saying that they care about our privacy in an article that says, we care about your privacy and asking to be able to track you. You don't sit and say, oh, let me go through the navigation options of the cookies and disable everything. No, we just click I accept. Some companies, they're like, oh, so you know what, screw those Europeans. I'm not even going to offer this anymore in Europe. But that's what GDPR has given us. Fines that has been collected as taxes, which we do not know where it's going, and a hell of a lot of pop-ups. Not much more. And a few people that have suddenly become arrogant emailing us and saying, I want you to remove me from my database. Normally, they're students. Why? Because we've got all of this information that is yearning for our attention because they're going to make money if they get our attention. They're all competing for our very, very short attention span. Why? So that we end up clicking on their ads. That is what it's all about, but that is what it's always been about. When you were on TV and you were watching advertising and you were watching the news, it was just entertainment because they wanted you to then watch the adverts that were between the news. That's what it's always been about. It's just so much more powerful now. Of course, some people are starting to say, well, this is not sustainable. We're going to move to a new paid model. So, for example, if you go to The Guardian, The Guardian now says, hey, support us. You know, you don't have to support us, but it would be nice if you would support us. And you Telegraph, initially, The Telegraph was, you know, you can come to The Telegraph and you can read five articles for free. Usually on the Telegraph, one article is enough to read. You don't need to read the other four. But you can read five articles. And then they started to say, okay, this article is premium, which meant you can't even read it. And then the next one, premium. Now if you go to the, go to the Telegraph, there's really nothing for free anymore. It's all moved to a pay model. But the best part of all of this is that they still do the advertising as well. So you're getting the advertising and you're getting to pay them. Well, I, I really like this one from uh, The Independent that talks about how, if you pay them, they can do independent journalism, but we will continue to provide it for free as well. So how does that exactly work? So if I'm paying, I get a different version of the news than someone that's not paying? How, how are you trying to do that? Yeah. Support free-thinking journalism. No, it, there, there, there is no such thing as free-thinking. But anyway, a lot of us say, oh, you know what? I don't even get the news from my media anymore. I don't even read the newspaper. This is a, a thing of the past. It's all about social media now. Social media is the new media. Everyone is a microjournalist. I love that word, microjournalist. And it's given everyone a voice, and it's given us a whole lot of information overload. It's, it's become impossible for us to look at everything. And we've got Twitter. We've got Facebook. We've got Snapchat. We, we had Google+. Plus. It was, it was one person, and they're like, no, we, we, need to, we need to shut this down. And they're like, no, I don't want to be here. No, no, it's okay. Just, just we need to shut it down. And all of these have created these walled gardens, a curated environment in which we follow like-minded people. I often ask people, like, hey, do you follow this person? Screw them. They're completely contrary to my views and ideals of the world. So we follow those that are like-minded like us. And the platform curates this. We block those people we don't agree with. I don't have time for that. And we end up in our own echo chamber, listening to our own worldviews most of the time about the things that we think are correct. And who takes care of us? Our keeper, the platform. It creates content that matters to us. It shows us news that we should care about. And we trust the keeper. And not only trust it, but we help the keeper. How? When we like something, we hit like. If we don't like it, we hit dislike. And we hit share. Whether we like it or not, we'll always hit share. And it encourage us. You got, you got a blog post, the first thing they say, oh, put this widget to share. You go to Twitter. I, I've signed up for an account on Twitter, which I hardly use. Every once a week or so, I get an email from Twitter saying, hey, we missed you. Go online and share. Share, share, just share. And these algorithms, what are they focused on? Revenue, engagement. How do they do it? They're focused on engaging people. They're focused on targeting people. 
And the problem is that they are focused on curating your environment. So there are things that you see, but you don't know what you actually are not seeing. There are examples of this. You probably all heard about this fiasco that came out where Facebook banned this publication by a, a photo of this child saying that it's child pornography. And there was a newspaper in, in Norway that surfaced this and Facebook said, oh, I'm so sorry. We didn't mean to think, we didn't mean to do that. But what about all of the other ones we don't hear of? What about all of the other news and things that we are not hearing of being censored or not showing in your timeline because you've trained that algorithm so nicely to engage with you? Facebook has actually content moderation guidelines. If you look through it, it says things such as, you know, remarks such as someone shoot Trump should be deleted because a head of a state is a protected category. Videos of violent deaths, while marked as disturbing, do not always have to be deleted because they help create awareness of issues such as mental illness. And there's, of course, the human side of censorship, which is basically a bunch of sweatshops in different countries with low-paid workers that are sitting there and reviewing all of the violence, the head choppings, everything that's going on so that we can look at our nice cat pictures and the false images of our friends projecting what they think or what they want their life to look like at a human cost. There was literally nothing enjoyable about the job. You'd go into work at 9 a.m. every morning, turn on your computer and watch someone have their head cut off every day, every minute. That's what you see, heads being cut off. A content moderator on Facebook. Nice. But the question is, of course, even despite this, do I see everything? Do I see everything that's going on on these platforms or do I only see what is curated for me to see? But we get this bite-sized information which can easily be shared. And we start to think about this model of share. Everyone wants us to share because they want to bring us to their platform. So you say, you know, I know Mr. Frog. Mr. Frog and I have been friends for a very, very long time. So Mr. Frog tweets and says, oh my God, this is definitive proof that the earth is flat. The article is mind-blowing. Now, this is, this is ridiculous, right? Although in some parts of the world, they, they actually don't think that this is ridiculous, which is the scary part. But I'm like, okay, well, I know Mr. Frog. So let me see what my share flow goes like. Well, this is someone I generally trust. I've skimmed the article. It more or less aligns with what I think. I'll share it and maybe read more in detail later, right? I see a tweet, aligns with my, you know, confirmation bias in place. I know the person, they're generally honest, bam, share. Well, we generally don't do. Let me see if it's fake or not. Let me read the article in detail and contrast it with other sources. Let me see that entire video clip of that tiny little short clip that they've edited for them to prove their point and see that in the bigger context. Maybe they're misinterpreting something. We don't look at any of these things. We don't even read the comments on the post of saying, hey, you know what? Maybe the, someone tweeted something and someone on the third reply has said this is fake. We don't even bother doing that before we share. Why? Because we don't have time. How can we have so much attention span? We share and we forget. And these buttons make it really, really easy for us. And we share on many topics about companies and organizations, about individuals, about politics. I mean, you've all heard of the 29 stages of the Twitter shitstorm, right? Someone does something bad. A company does something bad. Someone catches wind, makes the rounds. A famous person makes a comment about it. The media notices. Companies forced to apologize. Everyone forgets and moves on to tomorrow. This is essentially what our society has become. Share, bitch, and forget. That is what it's become. And, but you say, no, but this is good because we've shown these nasty corporations. Yesterday, I was in the airport in Frankfurt, and this Lufthansa employee shouted to a customer, said, shut up, like this, in his face. I took to Twitter, and I said, shame on you, Lufthansa. I, I've been given a voice, right? I've been given a voice. I'm going to show those evil corporations. But what about the individuals? Have you ever heard of the case of Justine Sacco? Who's heard of Justine Sacco? 
Okay, let me remind you, Justine Sacco was a lady that worked for a very large media corporation, and she was in London Heathrow, and she was about to get on a plane to go to South Africa, and she tweeted, I'm going to South Africa, I hope I don't catch AIDS, I'm just kidding, I'm white. Now, Justin Sacco's life was destroyed eight hours later when she landed. She was fired, she was harassed, she was doxxed, her, her complete life was over. For, for four years, five years, she went into hiding. She's now actually gone back to work. She is the only one. A lot of people would say that, send that tweet. Any comedian could say in that tweet, and everyone would say, oh, it's, it's satirical, it's sarcasm, it, it, it's facetious, whatever. I don't know if she was joking or she was not, but she was classified as a racist, and her life was destroyed. And that was in an interval of 24 hours. And then we moved on to the next thing. We saw a tweet, oh, this is disgusting. Let me share and forget. But what about the stories we haven't followed up on? What about the suicides that happened because of these? What about the lives that were destroyed because of these? Basically, social media has become our judge, jury, and executioner. We are all three. If you remember the movie 1984, Five Minutes of Hate, yes? Let's just hate for five minutes and then move on to the next thing. But these things have a much broader impact as well. There's violence. Messages going on in WhatsApp in India saying there was three people that had violated a girl or done something evil. It was completely false. What did they do? They went and they smashed and they killed these three people. And they were completely innocent because of false information that was shared and shared and shared without people contrasting. Burned to death because of a rumor on WhatsApp in Brazil and in other places. And then, of course, you have politics. And everyone was shocked with Cambridge Analytica. Oh, my God, what could they, what, how, how did this happen? Okay, well, let's think. If we can target someone with a washing machine, why can't we target them for voting for something? It's like common sense, right? Whoa, really? So you mean that I can go to Facebook and say I want to target a specific racial profile in a specific region and I only want to show this to them? Yes. They call it filtering configuration of, of advertising. Wow. And everyone's like, oh, my God, Cambridge Analytica did all of this. It's called targeted advertising. And there's no regulations in place that doesn't say you can't do political advertising. Even today, even in Spain, my, the, the savior party, which is they, they call themselves the left um, wing party that, that want to come and save society and save Spain, they spend tons of money more than any other political party on Facebook advertising, sending specific messages. And then you have this awesome feature in Facebook, which is called dark posts. It's actually called dark posts. It's like even they're, they're thinking like, maybe this isn't the best name for it, right? So they don't show up on your feed or follower stream. They avoid looking like spammy content. They allow precise micro-targeting, targeting specific people based on age or gender, etc. They allow for better A-B testing. Wonderful. Yes? And invented by Facebook, available on all platforms. This is available now. Now it's available everywhere. So we have micro-targeting, which is profiling voters based on social media and other data, and it's creating tribes. And we are tribe. We are tribal people. We align with tribes. We want to be part of something. And we go with this tribe. Yes? In, in the software developer world, we call it evangelism or whatever you want to call it. This is our inherent nature. And we have this tribe spread the message, and we call it word of mouth marketing. And it works just like it does for selling products as it does for buying votes. There's a very good talk on TED, which is called We're Building a Dystopia Just to Make People Click on Ads. Recommend you watch it. But can anything good come out of all of this? Yes, absolutely. Yes, I don't know if you saw the time where uh, a lady's life was saved in Saudi Arabia because she... They, she got a whole bunch of media attention because if she was going to go back, she was going to be uh, tortured and killed by her family. They saved a life. What, anyone remember the Arab Spring? Yes? No? The Arab Spring? Oh, my God, let's support all of the people in Egypt. The, their uprising. Who, who gives a crap about Egypt today? Nobody. Everyone forgot. What happened to all those people? What about those people that went in front that we were cheering on and potentially risk their lives. Anyone remember the green avatar for Iran? 
I was born in Iran. I remember this. Everyone started to put their avatars in green. Support Iran. People would see this and they're like, oh my God, the whole world is supporting me. Let me go out. Oh, oops. Oh, sorry. You just got shot. Real lives are at stake and we're taking part. You know, Neil Postman spoke about passive observers. That we're watching TV and we're saying, oh, this is bullshit and that politician is crap and this. Now, we've become armchair participants. With our phone, we're sharing, promoting, sharing, encouraging, doing whatever, and not caring of what happens the day after tomorrow. But you say, oh, forget politics. I'm not in this for politics. I'm in this about friends and family. Look, I just like to sell, take selfies of pics and food. That's what I want to do. I just want to browse through friends' timelines and see what they're up to. No, they're up to what they want you to think they're up to. Some, I think it was Dan North that, that famously said that uh, Facebook, that someone said, why did, why did Facebook buy WhatsApp? And he said, because on Facebook, you project what you want people to think you are. And on WhatsApp, you exchange messages of what you really are. So it helps me stay connected with friends and families. Yes, me as well. I quit WhatsApp a few years ago when Facebook bought it. My, my mother said, my family, how do we reach you? I said, you pick up the phone. Now they're using Signal. I've moved them over to Signal. But what about the psychological impacts? You know, the scroll and refresh. I sit on the plane. I watch people. Open Facebook, refresh. Close Facebook, open Twitter, refresh. Close Twitter, open Instagram, refresh. We're just doing this all the time. How many likes did I get? Why aren't people retweeting me? Oh, look, what a wonderful life others are having and not me. I'm going to get depressed. We don't link it, or do we? Do we link it to all of the cases of teenage suicide that is happening because of the impact and the influence of social media? There's a lot of cases, a lot of cases. We don't think about that that much. And it's not just about social media. We are sharing so much data. You want to do training, there's an app for it. You want to run, there's an app for it. Lose weight, wine, sleep, work, read, watch. Anything that you can think of, there is an app for it. And now we don't even need apps. You know, you can call it Alexa, Google, Siri, Cortana, Bixley. You can call it out. There's an app for it. And you're like, oh, big deal. This is really, really useful. So what that I get some targeted ads? Bruce Schneier said, surveillance is the business model of the internet. We build systems that spy on people in exchange for services. Corporations call it marketing. That's what we've basically done. Right? But you're like, oh, my data is meaningless. I mean, I, there's, I'm not hiding anything. I get it free. And in fact, there's a cafe now in Boston that says, if you give us your data, we'll give you a free latte. Amazon Go. You ask your, gener your newer generation, go into Amazon and see what you're shopping. And I don't care. I don't care that I'm being watched. And it, even if you're not, even if you care, you only just find out. Amazon reportedly employed thousands of people to listen to your Alexa conversations. Oh, that's why I don't use, um, that's why I don't use Alexa. Don't worry. You've got the same in Siri. Oh, Apple contractors will stop listening to your Siri recordings. Don't worry. Google does the same. Google is voice assistants is listening. And if you're still using that piece of rubbish called Skype, they do the same as well. Right? Why? Because people don't want to pay. If Google would start charging money, would you pay? Nah, screw that. I should get it for free. Now, remember the saying, you are not, if you're not paying for the product, you're not the customer, you're the product being sold. Yes. Nowadays, you're paying and you are the data and you are the product. The world's most valuable resource is no longer oil, it's data. And guess what? One of them doesn't finish. And it's getting worse. We've got the Internet of Things. LG threatens, LG threatens to put Wi-Fi in every appliance it introduced in 2017. Guess what it did? LG smart appliances now work with both Amazon Alexa and Google Assistant. How to turn off your TV to start snooping on you. This is ridiculous. Like I'm sitting in the living room and it's no longer I want to talk to my wife and say, hey, listen, wait, let, let, let's go outside because the kids are at home. I say, hey, let's go outside because the TV is listening. This is what it's become. But we keep focusing on the Internet of Things. What about the Internet of People? And there's the literal sense of that in Sweden. They want to put a microchip so that you can go to a shop and go, bam, and pay. You don't even have to take out your phone. But it's not about having a microchip. We're not the Internet of Things. We are the Internet of People. All of us have become part of the system that is just feeding this data through different mechanisms. And we've sacrificed our privacy 
because it's quite convenient. And questions we don't usually ask, do they store my data? Do they send it anywhere? How can they use it? Is it safe? In terms of what? I get my applications updated every time I look at my phone. Yeah, it's called continuous delivery or deployment or releases. It's awesome. We make 100 releases a day. Customers love it. Do you read the terms of services every time they update? I don't. Londoners gave up eldest children in public Wi-Fi. This was that um, uh, previous guy that, uh, name forget, but Mirko. Uh, he did an experiment where he said, I'm going to give free Wi-Fi out to Londoners as an experiment. And in the terms of condition, it said, if you sign up for free Wi-Fi, I will, you give your firstborn to us. A lot of people did sign up. Behind at home DNA testing company sharing genetic data with third parties. You didn't sign up for that, but they're doing it. AI could reinvent medicine or become a patient's nightmare. Why? Uh, the Mayo Clinic and Google have just entered an agreement. Oh, but it's all going to be anonymous. Yes, but guess what? If we're tracking a whole bunch of data here and all of this anonymous data here and we get your searches and we get this, there are ways to connect that together at some point. Roombas, mapping your house without you knowing it. Sex life apps use shared information with Facebook. Yeah. Default options in your apps. I use Untapped. And uh, I don't use it as much as other people. Uh, and, but the thing is that uh, one day I bought this horrible beer and I tried it and it was horrible. And I searched for it to see what other people think of it outside of Untapped, just in Google. And I saw my page show up. I'm like, hey, wait a minute, well, why is this showing up? I'm not log in, logged into anywhere. I went into incognito window. I searched for it. It still shows up. My whole profile is public. Why? Because in some option, they changed it to public. Thousands of Google calendars possibly leaked because people don't really look into the default options of things. Do we take time to configure these? You know, some time ago, I linked into, uh, I logged into LinkedIn, it says, Hardy, you're the boss of your account. I'm like, finally, I'm the boss of something. And I started to look through the privacy, and I said, okay, so what can I configure here? Let me see. On the tab privacy, I have your profile, who can see your connections, okay. Um, how others see you on LinkedIn. Um, how LinkedIn uses your data. Job seeking preferences, blocking and hiding. And that was just one tab. And then I got the ads. Who sits and goes through all of that and says, let me configure those default options so that they protect my privacy? You do. I do. Not generally the people outside of this room. Facebook says it needs to always know your location and is warning iOS and Android users against turning it off. Which, okay. Well, fortunately, we can trust Facebook. Boss headphones spy on listeners. Lawsuit. Vibrator makes to pay millions over claims that secretly tracked users. AccuWeather caught sending user location data, even location sharing is off. 500 Android apps on Google Play and found spying. Uber's iOS had the God mode and it had permissions to copy stuff. Runkeeper keeping track of you where you're going without you knowing. AT&T, this is brilliant. This is location off. AT&T using towers is giving, selling your location data in the US to people. And you couldn't even opt out of it. Someone gave someone $300 and they located them, even with location services switched off. And this is when they don't tell you this is the default options, but what about the software issues? This, is an, this, this pissed me off. I use Cam Scanner. I've been using it for years. Three weeks ago, I saw this news that, oh, there's a malware of some plugin ad that's been uploading all my shit to somewhere else as well. Wonderful. Great. And that's a protected app. Yes, if you're using Cam Scanner, please uninstall it now. Twitter warns that private tweets were public for years. Oh, it was an issue. Sorry about that. Facebook bugs switch millions of privacy settings to public. Sorry, bug. Major iPhone FaceTime lets you link in and talk to people and see people without them knowing. And what if someone else accesses it? Doxagram, right? Always being, you know, we're getting hacks less than life. Major breach found in biometric system used by banks, UK police, and defense firms. This isn't even your little schmoozy sh software shop that doesn't know how to protect stuff. This is large public entities and corporations that are being hacked. Credit reporting firm Equifax. But don't worry. They got sued. And I think people got back something like $100 each for all of their credit ratings to be hacked. And what if people start to use this data against you? Yeah, 
You get someone pissed off on the internet, they start to dox you, they start to research you, they start to try and find information from you. You know how easy it is to find information? Fortunately for us, well, the majority of us, I'm guessing some, there are people here that mainly live in the US. If you live in the US, you're pretty much screwed. There's a website called True Search. You can go to it. Family tree now. Enter your name. It shows you your family tree and it shows you all your records. Their sister company of True People Search. Go there, enter someone's name. It shows their address, where they live, their past telephone numbers, everything. Have you seen that episode of Black Mirror? Of the Chinese rating system and that? Yes? You've got that as well. It's called mylife.com. So I tried this the other day. I entered my colleague's uh, uh, name and the state where he was born. Here's what it said. OK, locating reputation is going to give me address, phones, property records, lawsuits, everything. It's going to give me his social profiles and photos. At this point, it already had correct information about him. It then is preparing information about local and federal court records, public web, social media, and internet profiles. Then it's collecting information. No, then it's telling me, listen, I'm going to give you all of this information, but don't use it against the person, OK? You agree that you won't use this against the person. And the whole freaking point of the website is know someone's reputation before you engage with them. And then it says, but don't use it against them. So you're like, okay, I agree. I click to continue. And then it's like, oh, we're searching. We're going to see if their comprehensive profile may contain personal information, photos, and everything. Yes? And we're going to see if there's any, you know, what, what, is, what is this part? Oh, they, they've been into law, illegal systems, and everything. Verifying addresses and locations, satellite pictures of their houses if there is, all of that information coming to you, and you get it, and you get it, and it's preparing the report, and at some point it says, there you go, the report is finished, pay me, and I'll send it to your email. Peanuts, yes? 12 months, $4 a month. Now, you imagine how valuable that is to many people and many companies. And all of that is available online. Well, it's public records. All we did was put the public records online. Who the hell told you to do that? And give free access to everyone to it. You're like, again, big deal. I really don't have anything to hide. And it's okay with the ads. Now, I'm not a big fan of Snowden, but I do agree with what he said, is that arguing that you don't care about the right to privacy because you have nothing to hide is no different than saying you don't care about freedom of speech because you have nothing to say. At some point, something will be used against us. All of us. We all have secrets. That's what makes us humans. It's not as if we live in an Orwellian society. Well, no. In 1984, Orwell was talking about 19 censorship. He was talking about control, Big Brother. We don't have any of that. Who remembers PRISM? The FBI is building a national watch list that gives companies real-time updates on employees. So it's now the FBI is collaborating with private sector. It's awesome, right? PRISM? Ah, it doesn't matter. We'll help you. You don't even need to private ac access private data anymore. If you sign up for an ESTA right now, to go to the US, they want your GitHub profile, your Twitter profile, social profile, and they'll look through it. You don't give it, ah, oh, you might have issues going in. China, this is already happening, is ranking their citizens based on credits. And if you violate that credit, you won't get a train ticket, you won't get a plane ticket. There's a bunch of things that you're no longer accessible for. I was on this train as well, and it is true. There's an announcement that says, behave, or it will affect your credit scoring. Why? Because there's a camera in every single location in China, every single location you go to. There was a very good um, example of this on the BBC. A guy said, I'm going to pretend to be evil, give my photo to the police. I'm going to go somewhere in some public place in China. How long will it take them to locate me? It took them seven minutes to locate that person. And they want to track down on anonymous, so you know you have to now register with real things. So, China, Chinese telecom ZTE is helping Venezuela build a system that's called the Fatherland Card to give people help with food, etc. There you go. You register. You know exactly what you're doing every morning, right? How many of you are? I mean, if you're in London, you use the Oyster Card. Hey, register your Oyster Card. So that if you lose it, you can easily get a replacement. Also, we'll know exactly where you are all the time. Fantastic. A, f a colleague of mine works in Singapore, and he had a device on his hand 
which was, I'm like, what is that, a Fitbit? He's like, no, this is some other device that is uh, given to me by the Singaporean government. I said, what for? He's like, if we do enough steps, we get credits so that we can get discounts on groceries, etc. Right? They dropped that. Now they're actually partnering with Fitbit to do it. There you go. And legislation is slowly creeping in. UK, oh, well, let's just forget about the UK. Australians. I mean that in the most loving way. Like, like, getting rid of encryption is the last problem they have right now. But Australians, set to become guinea pigs for worldwide war on privacy. Dutch House of Representatives passes draconian dragnet surveillance bill. In Spain, we said, hey, you know what they did with Cambridge Analytica? Yes. Okay, let's make that a law so that it's allowed to be done. I told you we're really good at this. Germany wants access to citizens' data. That sparked fears of sinister past. Freedom of the Internet report shows that year after year, our freedom is going down. But it's going down slowly, just a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit. You know, when you don't notice, it's just going down. Tiny, tiny, tiny. And companies are caving in. They say, oh, we'll abide by your rules. Bing in China. Yes, Bing is in China. Netflix is in Saudi Arabia. We don't like this show. It criticizes I don't know who. Oh, don't worry, we'll take it off the platform. Apple in China. China has a rule that everything that is in China basically has to go through China. So how are we doing if we look back at Aldous and at Huxley? Censorship, we got it. Control, we got it. Big Brother, we got it. Information is entertainment, we got it. Relevance is lost in irrelevance, we got it. Psychological manipulation, we've got it. Shallow form of entertainment, we've got it. So we're doing quite well. In the song, Roger Waters says, welcome, my son, welcome to the machine. Where have you been? It's all right. We know where you've been. Welcome to, this, my, welcome to the machine. What did you dream? It's all right. We told you what to dream. He's talking about the record industry. This could well be applied to our society now. They're telling us what to do, and they know what we're dreaming and where we're going. And now, of course, artificial intelligence wants to play a big part of this as well. We got facial recognition. We got manipulation in billboards. Remember I said that billboards targets everyone? No, in Piccadilly Circus in the UK, now they've set up billboards that can react to the people in the street. And based on the generation, based on the average age, based on different information, they can start displaying different targeted advertising. We've got fake video generators. We've got fake voice generators. We've got fraudsters using deep fakes to generate voices that will tell us that we should do something and it's not our voice. But we all know that AI has issues, right? Because this idea of like, well, let's get rid of the people and we'll just leave the AI. The AI has the issue of bias. Google classifies this into three categories. Google, right? Selection bias. The data that is used to train the algorithm is, based, is biased to begin with. OK, I tell you what. Let's create algorithms that aren't biased. And they will be unbiased. And we'll let the algorithms decide, OK, what data are you going to feed it? Well, we've got centuries of data of our human existence. That's biased. Oh, that one, it won't be biased once we put it in the machine. Interaction bias. Bias is algorithm in the way the user interacts with it. And latent bias. The algorithm incorrectly correlates data with gender, race, and income. This is a problem that's existed for a very long time, even before AI. Here's an example of machine bias. The one on the left is the innocent person. The one on the right is the guilty. What did the machine say? Reverse. Statistics prove the black person should be guilty. Gender, race. You all know about Tay, right? Yes? Then, OK. Amazon scraps secret AI recruiting tool that shows bias against women. And then, of course, we have naive implementations of play like, oh, yeah, I'm going to detect sarcasm if there's an emoji on there. But of course, this, as I said, this dates back to before machine learning. There's a very good book called Weapons of Math Destruction, which talk about how in the US, for example, the police um, authorities were using data based on zip codes, et cetera, to use that to qu classify where potentially there's going to be more crime. And guess what? It was correlating poorer people to race, to gender incorrectly. This has been around for a long time. Right? And it's not just about AI. It's about the data. The only difference is that now AI says, you don't need to teach me. I'm learning about it. And then we're not even talking about AI in the military. right? And there are concerns about this. Okay. You know, Sergey is concerned about it. Uh, this guy is concerned about it. Elon Musk is concerned about it. Elon Musk also thinks we're going to Mars. There's a lot of things, right? So in summary, we're kind of screwed. 
right? I mean, I told you this is going to be a very depressing talk. Who's, who's inspired? No. <laughs> okay. Now, the bad news is that this isn't an episode of Black Mirror. The good news is that there isn't really much in terms of good news. So what, if anything, can be done? Realistically, what can we actually do? Well, as a society, we cannot do GDPR. Or if we want to do GDPR, let's not do it the way we've done it right now. There are different efforts of, you know, promoting, this is Tim Berners-Lee, a web developer, um, if you don't know him. And he was, uh, started a new initiative about trying to protect the web because he's seeing where this is going and it's not going in the right way. Certain regulations, data checks, as po po uh, pointed out by Kathy O'Neill in her book, Weapons of Math Destruction. Check objectivity and transparency of algorithms. Ethics in the use of technology, although I don't know how ethical, how useful that's going to be. As companies, so some companies have actually taken steps. You know, this company says, uh, New York Times says, after GDPR, and we cut off the ad exchanges in Europe, and our revenue didn't decrease. We start to need to move to a model that is sustainable. India, Supreme Court rule privacy a fundamental right in landmark case. Fact check now available in Google search. Google is trying to implement this feature where you can actually, when someone, you read an article or there is something, you can try and do a fact check about it. YouTube is one of the worst examples of how to monetize a platform. I mean, they've done a very good job, but they've used the worst algorithms possible. Because YouTube is all about engaging you. How do they engage you? Through violence, through confrontation. If you notice, it doesn't matter what video you start on, you'll end up on some video about some guy called Ben Shapiro who is putting down some liberals or some liberal putting down someone else. It drives you to violence. Start with a video of doing snowboarding. Watch it. It'll say, snowboarding, jumping up. Oh, jumping off a high cliff. Oh, falling off snowboarding. Battle of the snowboards. Death by snowboard. It just goes down that path. That's why it's very dangerous. You know, one time my kid was watching YouTube with a without my supervision. And then he started to cry because it ended up from a prankster killing cats. This is the algorithms. And now Google says that they're trying to improve this. Microsoft president, democracy is at stake. Regulate big tech. OK, let's regulate big tech. But the problem is that this isn't just about big tech. Big tech has made it easy. Part of the problem is us. We are part of the problem. Because all we've done with big tech is made everything more accessible. But we're the ones that have become judge, juries, and executioners. So there are a thing, few things that we can do. As consumers, we can stop putting all the blame on technology. You know, social media is an existential threat to our idea of democracy. OK, so when democracy goes your way, it's OK. But when it goes bad, it's an existence, existential threat. No, 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 because it's all of the fake stuff. Okay, but who's sharing all of that fake stuff? Not everything we agree with is real. In fact, there was an article in Wired that says that there's a hell of a lot of the internet that is false. But it's fake, fake reviews. Have you ever heard about the most successful um, restaurant in London that got to the top of TripAdvisor? It was a garden shed. And there was bookings for years. Right? TripAdvisor comments. Fake comments, fake businesses, fake politics, fake news. But now all of this fake thing has generated another issue because everything that we disagree with is not a bot or fake news either. So just as much as we're getting a lot of fake stuff, we're also falling into this, again, using our confirmation bias of saying, well, since I don't agree with this, it must be fake. And this isn't technology. This is us. We need to contrast the information that we read. We need to understand that there are narratives at play. Just like there were in the radio, in the telegram, in the TV, there is today. The Telegraph has its own narrative. The Guardian has its own narrative. The Daily Mail is as a pile of whatever. Right? There are narratives at play for each of these. No one is independent. Nothing is independent. Everyone has a motivation. 
And we got to be aware of our own confirmation bias. We got to break out of our own bubbles. We got to start confronting others. We got to not, sorry, not confronting, learning about confront, confronting views. Not stay in our bubble and say, I only will follow like minded people. Follow people that you disagree with. Follow people that are not aligned with your political or world views and try and see other views because it's only through c c communication and understanding that we lead to a better place. I get recommendations to follow Donald Trump and Alexandria. I don't follow either, but I get enough of them without following them. Check and contrast links. Even for this talk, every link, every source that I've put, there's a source. Look at it. I try and go through everything to make sure that it wasn't fake, that it's not updated. If it is, call me out for it. But as producers, evaluate before handing over your data. Analyze before blindly sharing stuff. Evaluate the consequences of a retweet. Don't just retweet because it's cool, because you want to jump on board the share train. You don't need to. Evaluate what will happen with that retweet. Will it hurt a person? Will it hurt a company? Did you contrast it? Is it right for you to do that? Think if it were you, what you would want people to do. Essentially, think first. Think before you tweet in the uh, rise of an attack. Again, a very good article by The Wired, which was saying, if part of terrorism is to invoke terror, and if we now use social media to share and show bad images and share, what is it doing? Contributing to more terror. It's not alerting people, get out of this area. It's just sharing more and more terror. Facebook's 10-year challenge. Oh, yeah, here, show me what you look like now and in 10 years. Oh, let me just now, because I want to see how you look. No, it's just training the algorithms to do aging. As technologists, educate the less tech savvy. Talk to your parents, talk to families, talk to people that you don't, that aren't in the tech world, that aren't aware of these algorithms, that aren't aware of these things and the consequences that it has. Explain to them the dangers of technology. We have a responsibility to do that as technologists. Drive towards more sustainable models. Don't just say, let me create something, get a lot of users, sell their data and profit. Work towards more sustainable models. Work towards that not everything has to be given away for free and things start to have value, where we don't sell everyone's data. This is a very good uh, letter of selfish love, letter to the uh, venture capitalist, where this lady was saying, basically, I'm getting a whole bunch of stuff, very f um, cheap or free, because of VCs. Well, at some point, those VCs will cash out, and they want to be able to get some money for everything they've put in. Another good article, which was talking about how some companies are, and, and communities are going back to more local, smaller communities. You know, Facebook talks about 7 billion of the world's people connected. Maybe it wasn't a good idea to connect 7 billion people in the world. Maybe it was okay to just connect 100 neighbors. Because the problem is that even though we have a name, we are all anonymous. I don't give a crap about someone that is in Indonesia, and if I humiliate them, share, retweet, whatever, it doesn't matter. Just like someone in Indonesia might not give a crap about me. And when I say me in Indonesia, I, what I'm saying is that we are anonymous to people all over the world. We don't care how what we do really impacts their life. And yet, what have we done? We've given the most biggest platform, and essentially, you, you talk about Trump, you talk about other political leaders. Zuckerberg has now basically become one of the most influential people in the world and most powerful because he can basically move you in any direction he wants. Seven billion people. Create interfaces that favor privacy first. Move away from dark UI patterns in privacy. This is a good idea where it adds a little mushroom on top of a device that only when it hears the word, OK, Google, would it let everything else go through. Because otherwise, these devices are always listening, recording, and then at some point, deleting the information. Think about how you can improve these things. Security shouldn't be an afterthought. Account and work for diversity, because different people in the world have different needs. They interact differently. We need to take this into account when we design things. Teach discuss and promote ethics, although I don't know how much this will work. I was recently talking to someone that was a new nuclear physicist in NASA, and he's like, yeah, we took an ethics course at university, but look what good that did. Like, some of us are working on nuclear weapons. 
Right? So how much does that actually help? Facebook knowingly duped game-playing kids and their parents for money. Facebook pays teens to install VPN that spies on them. Facebook tracks information in your images. I mean, I could do a whole talk about Facebook. Facebook's five billion fine. The day they got five billion fine for all the wrongs they did, their stock went up. What is five billion for Facebook? What, a month revenue? Two months revenue? But no, we've got the GDPR and we've got the FTC to protect us. No, they're giving these people peanuts in fines. And it's the little companies that are being hurt by these regulations. You know, in Jurassic Park, it says your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Sometimes we need to stop and think if we should. As technologists, we have the greatest responsibility. So to summarize, whatever the machine may be, we are a cog in it, and there's no way getting out. The question is if we can change it or not. Thank you.